Good morning, everybody. Can I have everyone stand up for worship? All right, I'm going to open this up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come before you this morning. Um, I just pray that we will enter in this time of worship um, with humble hearts. And Lord, we love you. And we just sing this, these worship songs this morning um, to honor and glorify you. And um, yeah, just give us peace in this time as we reflect on what you've done in our lives this far. And we have the hope of what you're going to do in the future. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Revelation 7, 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no other, that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Singing in Creole.
guys may be seated. Amen. You know, um, I think about when we think about the greatness of God, how the, the Psalms actually speak to that. And it oftentimes speaks about the greatness of God in relationship to nature, that when we look around and we see the great works of God, how nature and creation just leads to um, the awe, the awe and splendor. And I, I think about um, when we were living in Portland, Oregon back in 1980, I remember we had first moved there and my wife and I were having a picnic on top of a uh, dormant volcano, actually it was, and we were looking out over at Mount St. Helens and beautiful snow-capped Mount St. Helens. It looked like the top of kind of an ice cream cone. It was just magnificent in its beauty. And we said, come summer, we're gonna go to Mount St. Helens and we're gonna hike up there. And it was that April, uh, March or April, that Mount St. Helens blew. And you can see, it was amazing, the pictures from that, the force of um, the blast and the devastation. But it reminded me again of um, a picture of the greatness of God, that on the one hand, you see this um, magnificent ice cream cone mountain of beauty. Um, but then at the other sense, where there's also this power, this power that's unleashed in the volcanic force and it really ought to cause us then to think about the greatness of God in a couple different ways. Number one, uh, who we, how we stand before God, who we are in relationship to our God. Uh, but then also in terms of the greatness of God in our own personal lives on a daily basis and how we relate to him. So this morning I'm reading from uh, Matthew chapter 10. If you have Bibles, you can turn there with me. Uh, the context for the passage is where Jesus is talking about sending out um, the disciples like sheep, sheep among wolves. So I'm going to start with the context and then emphasize the portion that Professor Allen is going to speak on today. Starting in verse 16, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent and doves. Be on your guard you will be handed over to the local consuls and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings and witnesses to them and to the Gentiles as witnesses. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And especially this that Professor Ellen wants to focus on this morning. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. So go to prayer. Um, I would like to be mindful that the, uh, spring break starts Friday. So woohoo for that, and I think that realizing that there's quite a few more in isolation right now in quarantine, our brothers and sisters, and mindful of them as we go to prayer as well, and uh, I think we're all looking forward to spring break. Let's pray. Father, I pray, especially for those who are in quarantine, those isolating, and um, that you would be near to them, that there would be a sense of your presence, and Lord, that uh, you would strengthen us as we um, push towards spring break and look forward to the refreshing break that we can have together. Lord, you're very aware that there's a certain weariness that we all have with dealing with COVID. And Lord, just help us to assess our times and to um, help each other, to offer a word of encouragement, to offer an act of service or love. Remind us of that, Lord, that we can serve each other in the midst of this. 
and comfort those, strengthen those who are not with us today. Pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and our ears to the message that Professor Allen has for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So our speaker this morning, Professor Tom Allen. I've known Tom for since 1992 when he first came out to the Wisconsin campus and I could say this about Professor Allen, we've shared a lot of life together. We're friends, we've encouraged each other, we've prayed with each other, we've supported each other through a lot of our ups and downs of life. And for that, I'm really grateful that I've known him since that time and he's really been a good friend. He's known to you, so I don't need to go into any longer introduction, Professor Tom Allen. I just learned something for which I'm really glad, and that is that Mark, you and Dana did not go back to Mount St. Helens that spring so that you're still with us. Appreciate it. Mark is a dear brother. What he didn't tell you is we have this weird history that whatever happens to one of us happens to the other of us. If he breaks his shoulder, I break mine. If he hurts his knee, I hurt mine. The worst time was when I went to Wisconsin Wilderness, I showed up there to teach, and I've been here 28 years, so this was a long time ago, and Mark said, you're not going to believe it, I just had hernia surgery. So I was like, wow, I'm sorry to hear that. So about the third day there, um, I had been carrying a boat, dragging it up a hill and playing basketball with the students, and I said, hey, Mark, what does a hernia feel like and look like? And um, he's like, and I showed it to him kind of in my groin, he's like, yeah, that's a hernia. So I ended up having, having a hernia. So now we have sort of an understanding. If something bad happens to one of us, we just call and say, don't go out today, just, just watch out. So we're praying that the pattern will, will break. But good morning, everyone. Thank you for letting me spend a few moments sharing with you before you go on spring break. Uh, years ago, when, when we needed to get somewhere, people actually, we had these weird things called maps. You had to hold them in your hand. And um, they were a pain in the neck to try to find things. And being men, I think all of you ladies remember watching your mom and dad, men hate to ask for directions. They're like, no, I'm pretty sure it's right up here. So that was a struggle. And then we moved to sort of an in-between thing. You guys are above this. But then we had this thing called a TomTom or a GPS. Now, that was way better. Like, hands down, that was way better. Um, and then, of course, now you can get it in your dashboard. And most of us now... We use a phone, but I don't even use Google Maps anymore. I use Waze because that's going to actually tell you, hey, go this way because there's a traffic jam there. But one of the things I remember about the GPS is when I lost my way, it would say recalculating, recalculating. And that would sort of remind me, oh, oh um, I'm, I must have lost my way. And then I would try to figure out how to get back on the path. And I'd like to suggest that from time to time, Christians are always on a journey of recalculating, of figuring out, what am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing? And so a long time ago, it became clear to me after the Lord had grown me and was still working so much in my life that we're here to advance the gospel and become disciples and make disciples who make disciples. Now that sort of comes out in our mission statement, educate students to serve Christ in the church society in the world. But I, I wanna focus a little bit this morning on recalculating as a disciple of Christ. And so I wanna remind you, as, as you look with me in the book of Matthew, since Mark already prayed, that Jesus uh, spoke of, now you, you'll notice that the translation Mark read from, uh, it said in verse 24, a pupil. Uh, that Greek word, mathetes, it can be translated a learner, a student, a disciple, a pupil. But it basically means somebody who engages as an apprentice, one who associates himself with somebody else who has a reputation or a set of views. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus, three times we have recorded in the Gospels where he has sort of this analogy like, if you're going to be a disciple, you need to become like the one discipling you. Two of them are in the context of persecution. So in this one, Jesus is telling them, it's going to get ugly and it's going to be hard. And he says, other than the fact that everyone's going to hate you, um, 
you know, it's going to be great. He says, you're going to be hated by everyone. But then he says in verse 24, a disciple's not above his teacher, a slave's not above his master. It's enough for a disciple that he become as his teacher. So, I want to give a definition of a disciple. And then I, I just want to spend a few moments. We don't have a whole lot of time, but it'll just kind of help you recalculate. We're going to answer the question, how do I begin that journey of discipleship and how do I continue my journey of discipleship? Now, most of you have already begun it, but a disciple makes disciples, so we're going to rehearse how to invite others to join that journey. So let's start, though, with the definition. If you want to jot this down, this has been helpful for me over the years to think this way. A disciple is a forgiven follower of Jesus. So we'll start with that. Years ago, when I used to say jot things down, people did weird things. They pulled out a pencil and they wrote it down. Apparently, you're jotting it down in your memory, but I said this a long time ago to somebody that I learned. The dullest pencil is better than the sharpest memory. This isn't something that's so profoundly, you know, jaw-dropping, but I would write it in the cover of your Bible somewhere. A definition of a disciple. A forgiven follower of Jesus who's growing to become like him. A forgiven follower of Jesus who's growing to become like him. Now, that's not all that profound, but it really does have a lot to it. So, we're just going to take a few moments to, to talk about becoming a disciple. How do I begin my journey of discipleship? Now, the irony is... Um, we make a big deal about people who have a dramatic conversion. In fact, um, I think perhaps uh, to a fault, we overemphasize the idea of this glorious day. So for example, oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my savior I met. And the reality is, Probably the amount of people that remember the day they became a disciple is far less than those who don't remember the day they were saved. And I think that's important that you understand as you look back on your journey of discipleship, it's not so important that you know when you began your journey, just that you have begun your journey. And I hope this will be helpful to you to think of it this way. To begin your discipleship journey... It starts with understanding the gospel information and then responding to the gospel invitation. Okay, so, so we're going to go back in your life, but then you're going to remember this because someday you're going to need to teach it to others. You're already doing that. And wait till you have kids, then it'll be on steroids. You'll be like, wait, what? Are you going to be satisfied with telling your kids, just ask Jesus in your heart. Billy asked Jesus in his heart. He's going to heaven. It's probably not ideal. So, it starts with understanding gospel information, and this is all like ABCs. You know this. You know that at some point you understood that you were a sinner. The Holy Spirit began to convict you of your sin. Now, if you're four years old, you know, what were your sins? You know, you, you were naughty. It wasn't like you were smoking weed, I hope, at four years old. Um, but you understood your sin. You understood the consequences of that. And then at some point you understood that Jesus hung on the cross and died for you. Okay, if, 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 you're, if you didn't understand that, it's impossible to be a Christian without understanding in at least a seed form the cross because it is the cross that is the central focus of salvation. The Bible says this is the gospel that Christ died for our sins. So somewhere at some point, you began to understand that Jesus hung on that cross and he was punished and shed his blood so that you don't have to be punished and that you could be completely forgiven. Now again, that's in seed form. It, didn't, it doesn't mean that you, you, know, you, you began to sing at four years old. I once was lost. You, you, you didn't go, I was blind but now I see. Now I realize there are some geniuses out there who probably when you were four years old you were reading Francis Schaeffer, Escape from Reason, or Lee Strobel's A Case for Christ, and the plausible arguments of the resurrection convinced you that this was the most suitable way. But most of you were just little kids who learned that Jesus loves you. But one day, it made more sense that Christ died instead of you, that Christ 
got the spanking that you deserve, that Christ paid it all, and that he was raised from the dead. However, let me remind you that the gospel is information that requires an invitation and a response. And this is where it's really important as you go back in, in your history. A lot of young people don't know when they were saved because many, many times you were invited to respond to the gospel. This drives me crazy. At the end of vacation Bible school when the teacher says to 200 kids, how many of you want to go down to H-E double hockey sticks? Mm -mm. How many of you want to go up and be with Jesus? Mm -mm. Okay, everyone bow your head. Bow your head. Say this prayer. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, come in my heart, come in my heart. Boop. How many of you said that prayer? And 200 kids raise their hand and go, <laughs> we had 200 kids saved. That's not, that's really not the response to the gospel that the Bible calls for. So, the two words that the Bible uses to, to summarize your response to the gospel are repent and believe. And they're really part of the same decision. Now, what I want you to understand is you don't even need to remember exactly when you made that decision, but you need to know that you have made that decision. You can't separate repentance and believing. They're part of the same decision. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it will say repent. Other times it will only say believe. Sometimes it will say repent and believe. The idea of repentance is simply a willingness. It's not works. It's a willingness to follow Jesus. This is one of the primary reasons why many people are not saved. It's not because they haven't seen John 3.16 in the end zone, right? John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But John 3.20 says, this is the condemnation. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm not, I don't want to change. I don't want Jesus changing me. But the other side is to believe. It's to trust. It's to believe that what the Bible promises, Jesus will keep his word. So many of you were taught to ask Jesus in your heart. Like, that's really not the essence of the gospel. The, the essence of the gospel is that you believe with all of your heart that Jesus died and rose again for you. That you are trusting that the only way you could go to heaven is because Christ paid for you. It's not something that you earned or deserved. It's not simply because you asked Jesus into your heart, but that you understood that he died for you, rose again, and, and, and you invited him to be your savior. If you've ever been to the beach, most of us haven't been rescued by a lifeguard, but those who have usually ask the lifeguard, please help, I'm, I need to be saved. So maybe as a little kid, you repeatedly said, Lord, would you be my savior? And each time the evangelist got up, he's like, if you're not sure, you better pray it again. And sometimes people say like this, if you're not 100% sure you're saved, you're 100% lost. That's nonsense, okay? So here's what I want you to think about. If you were to die today, do you have confidence that you will enter heaven. That if you stood before Jesus and he said, why should I let you into heaven? If you're sitting there going, well, I, I hope I'm a good enough person or I hope I, I, I got it right or I hope I did enough, then, then you need to be cleared up on the gospel. You ought to be thinking something like this. He shouldn't let me into heaven, but I have truly believed that Christ died and rose for me. It might have been when I was four years old on Granny's knee. It might have been in, when I was nine at Backyard Bible Club. It really might have been at 11 when I was at camp. So let me give you an illustration. I didn't see the sunrise this morning, but I know the sun's out. You don't need to know when you became a Christian. You just need to know that you're a Christian. If you're not sure, this is not the end of the world because you're still alive, but talk to someone. It's very common for Christians to have doubts about their conversion. So I'm trusting that most of you have already begun that journey of discipleship, and I hope this will provide some clarity for you. Don't worry about the day that you became a Christian. Just if you can say with confidence, I know that I'm willing to follow Jesus, and I'm trusting that his blood shed for me was enough to save me. Then on the basis of the promise of God, I pronounce you a forgiven follower of Christ. All right? And that's a message that we need to get out to our friends. How much do you have to hate someone to not share the gospel with them? Because if they don't hear and respond to the gospel, the Bible says they're going to perish. So I want to move then to remind you just briefly the second question. How do I continue my journey? So I've responded to the gospel, and now I'm a disciple. I'm a forgiven follower. But it doesn't stop there. It's not hell insurance. It's not a soul scalp. It's now a process. So Jesus says 
And I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 6, and we'll spend our last few moments just recalculating what does this journey look like. Apparently, Jesus used this saying more than once because John refers to it as well in John 15. But let's look in Luke 6, 39. Jesus spoke a parable to them. A blind man can't guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? Now, here it is in verse 40. A pupil is not above his teacher... But everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. So let's think about that. A disciple is a forgiven follower. So we are becoming fully trained to become like Jesus. So I want to take some time to think about that. How do I become fully trained? This is an interesting word. This word means to adjust and, and fill in deficiencies. It means to be fully trained and regularly practiced. In other words, there's no such thing as being a mature disciple right at conversion. It takes time and it takes practice, training, okay? We're disciples in training. And we all have a lot to learn. So let me suggest a couple of things to think about. First of all, the first part of, of being trained is learning what Christ has done for you. Okay? There's no point in trying to become like him until you understand the wonderful resources that we have in Christ. Right? To simply say, all right, now that you're a Christian, quit your cussing. And don't be fornicating. And don't hang around them kids that are worldly and wear makeup and stuff like that. That's so ridiculous, okay? The start of becoming a, a, a trained follower is to understand what Jesus has done for you on the inside. You have been radically transformed. God has changed the hard drive of your heart. He has, in the new covenant, given you a new heart. He has given me a new spirit. He has given me something within me that the Bible calls his seed abides in me that draws me to want to trust and obey him. In fact, said, God said, I'll make a new covenant with you and I'll put my word in your heart and I will cause you to walk in my commandments. It's a blessing to know this, that being a Christian, God is at work in me to will and work. He's creating within me a desire. So you should be able to kind of monitor and say, there's something inside of me that wants to obey the Lord, that wants to grow, that wants to recalculate while I get the idea that there's a struggle. But not only has he changed me on the inside so that I'm crucified and raised up as a new person, he's also put the Holy Spirit inside me. And having the indwelling presence of Jesus is a daily resource upon which I can learn to change. So there's no such thing for a Christian to say, I can't stop that or I can't do that because God never asks us to do anything that he doesn't enable us to do. You are a forgiven follower who has a new heart, a new spirit within you, and now God has given us the Holy Spirit. And as we're learning to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be in this process of transformation. So all of your Bible classes are not just information but they're information that becomes the foundation of transformation. In other words, I should be thinking, how does this show me what God has done for me? How does this show me what God has provided for me? So it starts with learning what God has done for you, but then it leads into beginning to practice what God is leading you. So I learn about my resources and now I become a growing, responsible disciple. So in other words, Jesus says, it's enough for a disciple to become like his teacher. You have to be fully trained. So some people teach discipleship like this. Let go and let God. Can I tell you something? If you let God, if you just let go and let God, you're not going to go anywhere, right? You're just going to sit there in the boat, okay? God is going to work in and through you but he does not ask you to let go. 
The Bible says we must discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1 says we must apply all diligence to our faith. So, I want to suggest that there's three primary areas that you can apply yourself to to help become like Jesus. The first is very personal. So, as I learn what God has done for me, I begin by responding with personal worship. Okay? And what I mean by that is to have a regular time with Jesus. Now, this is not rocket science, but when it's all said and done, a whole lot more is said than done. So this is the greatest battle that you will struggle as a Christian, to regularly spend time with Jesus. Nothing's more important than that. How do I know that? Because Jesus said so. When Mary and Martha were making dinner for him and, and Mary's sitting at his feet and just relating and worshiping and growing, Martha runs by busy for Jesus. Don't you care? And Jesus says, hang on, hang on, Martha. Lots of things are important in life, but one thing is necessary. See what this sister of yours is doing? She's sitting at my feet. One thing. So I fight for it and you and I have to fight for it together. A regular time with Jesus. There's a lot of reasons why it becomes hard. We're busy. The devil will fight against you. And sometimes we don't want to because somebody once said, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. But if you have gotten away from a regular time with Jesus, I guarantee you, you're spiraling down. The devil is prowling about and ready to devour you. And some of you feel that in your soul right now. And I get it because I've been there, done that, and it's not fun. And so maybe God's call to you is to just say, hey, for whatever reason, you've lost your first love. Just, just get back to regular time with Jesus. There's no getting around that. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, give us this day, our daily Daily bread, so it must mean I should pray daily, okay? Now, we don't have time this morning to go over what should I do during that time, but you can learn. There's plenty of people you could talk to Mr. Jalovic, talk to your pastor, talk to one of your friends. Hey, what do you do in your quiet time? So it's that worship time where you're spending time in his word and you're talking to him, you're responding in prayer and giving the day over to him. The Bible says that we are to take up our cross daily. And so this regular time with Jesus is the beginning of my, my, my transformation. My automatic default is me, right? So I don't wake up in the morning going, oh, how can I live for Jesus? That's what my, my Lord wants, but my flesh wants. How can I live for me? So spending time with Jesus helps me on a regular basis to learn to take up my cross daily, to remind myself, do not present your body as instruments of unrighteousness. Present yourself to God. Tom, remember this. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Begin to meet with Jesus. Yield to him. Ask him to use you. So number one, in the active part of being a disciple, if I'm a forgiven follower who's becoming like him, I need to spend time with him. So worship. Number two is community. You are going to need others to grow and become like Jesus. There is no such thing as an individual Christian who just sails off into the wilderness and comes back a mature disciple. It won't happen. I heard a group of pastors say, if you just gave a man a Bible and sent him in the woods, he'd come out a Baptist. And I would have preferred to stand up and say, if you give a man a Bible and send him in the woods, he'll come out a heretic. We need one another. Now, maybe mother taught you, and growing up, you were taught about sexual purity, and you learned 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee from youthful lusts. And that's a great verse to remember what to flee from. But the second half of that verse talks about what to flee to and who to flee with. It says, flee from youthful lusts, but then it says, but pursue. In other words, not just what you're running from, but what you're running to. You're running to Jesus. It says, pursue righteousness and love and peace. But not alone. It says, with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. In other words, I need other people in my life. And not just any other people, but other people who are trying to become like Jesus. 
There are friends here that you can find of every shade and color. You want to find people to smoke weed with? You can probably find them. But if you want to find people to grow in grace with, you can find them as well. Proverbs says, if you walk with, with wise people, you'll be wise. Your companion of fools, you'll suffer shame. So if you are in the mode to grow as a disciple, ask God to help you to find some others. People to pray with. People to be real with. People that you don't have to say, I'm fine all the time. People who you can tell, I'm mad, I'm sad, I feel had. I, I, I'm struggling, I'm doubting, I'm lusting, I'm tempted, I'm fearful, whatever. People that you can trust who are going to speak the truth into your life. You can't just have an accountability partner going, yeah, I only did this 12 times this week. How about you, nine? You're looking for others who are going to hold you accountable, speak the truth in love, pray for you and help you to grow. So if you don't have any friends like that, ask God to help you to get connected. So we need worship, we need community. And then I want to encourage you finally that it's important to be involved serving the Lord. Years ago, we used to um, be required here to go to church. That's so legalistic, right? I mean, <laughs> making people go to church. It's just going to turn them into hypocrites. Well, I certainly hope that you won't raise your kids that way. Because I can promise you if you offer your kids, do you want to go to church or do you want to stay in your pajamas and eat your chocolate pebble cereal and watch cartoons and maybe watch a veggie tale before we go out to play? I'm pretty sure what they're going to pick. So I, I, I want to encourage you to get involved in service in a local church. You say, where's the Bible say that? Well, in Romans chapter 12, Paul says this. He says, present your body a living sacrifice... Okay, so there's that surrender. And then he says, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed. So there's that ongoing process of discipleship. But as soon as he gets done that, he says, now, whatever gifts you have, whether it's teaching, mercy, compassion, hospitality, service, giving, do it. So ask yourself, in what way are you involved in any service for Christ where you're literally learning to use your gifts in a community of other Christians? Now, again, this is just a high-level overview, but I want us to close in prayer and just ask a couple questions. As we look on your own spiritual GPS, the Spirit of God is speaking to each one of us. In what way might he be telling you or me, recalculating? Maybe there's someone here you've never truly made a decision to follow Christ. Maybe you didn't understand. You thought, hey, I don't know why I'm taking religion classes. I've seen a number of students Come to know the Lord. God opened their eyes. So if you're not sure you're a Christian, but you want to be one, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I won't cast out. So just tell them right there in your seat. You're ready to follow him. You believe that he died for you. But then ask yourself this. Am I a forgiven follower who's, who's actively becoming like Jesus? I'm not standing up here as though I've arrived. I want you to pray for me. The devil is, is very, very cunning. But we're in this together. And ask yourself, are you living a life of worship, trying to be obedient as you're trusting Christ? Do you have any friends and community to help you? And are you involved at all in service? At the end of the day, the Bible says it is not those who hear the word that are blessed, but those who do it. And so may God help each one of us as we close to become disciples who are becoming like our master as we help others to become disciples. Could I get an amen? I didn't even hear that. Amen. It's the mask. Wait, could I get an amen? amen? Amen. That's not Baptist, that's biblical. In the Bible it says, others can give amen at your giving of thanks. I thank the Lord that he died for us struggling sinners, don't you? Amen. amen. So let's pray. Father, thank you for our few moments together as this is our last chapel before spring break. You know our hearts. Jesus, I thank you that you're so merciful. You're so patient. You're so caring, so kind and compassionate. You love us just as we are, but you love us too much to leave us this way. I suspect that there are some here who may not even have come to Christ yet. Maybe today you'll call them to yourself. I pray for others who are weak and wounded that you will comfort them, 
that their roots of assurance will go down deep today and that they will praise the Lord for their salvation. And then, Lord, for all of us, the songwriter nailed it when he said we're prone to wander. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we wander for whatever reason. There's a difference between a good sound excuse and excuses that sound good. We have no excuse to not live for you after you died and rose for us. So may the precious Holy Spirit help us to truly learn more of the resources that we have in you, that it's not us anymore, but Christ living in us, but then to adjust and practice to be disciples that are fully trained in worship, community, and service. May you continue to develop great leaders in our community. And Lord, may not one of us fall away. Keep us from the evil one. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you very much. God bless you. Have a wonderful break.